Two weeks ago, Pastor Rodden talked about how the ancient writers and in the first century, there was this prevailing belief that order in a household led to order in society. And so if we've got families, even though they are individual units, strong families collectively become strong societies. I'm a firm believer of that as well. And I don't know if you know this, but Singapore is also a firm believer of, of this. And you might have heard of movements or organizations such as Focus on the Family or Center for Fathering, uh, Dads for Life. And really, is this agenda, is this focus to how do we build stronger and stronger families as a country so that the country overall benefits? Having said that, despite this focus, I think that is, there's a lot to be concerned about and there's a lot of challenge when you look at families across the board. Uh, Ling Sing shared this statistic last week and I wanted to share the same thing as well. More than 22 Singaporean families are torn apart by divorce every day. And in these divorce cases, at least one child is involved. And when they polled parents, 70% of them say that they feel they are too busy to enjoy quality time with their children. Busyness is something that, that is a chronic thing. Singaporeans, you know, we're no notorious for, for busyness. Um, and one in four parents, 25% of parents, experience stress or negative feelings when their child wants their attention. So it's tough. It, you, you, you see that parents are struggling. And I think that parents like, like me, I'm a parent as well, parents like us, we feel the responsibility and the burden of building strong families. But I, I think one of the biggest problems or one of the biggest difficulties to doing that is that parenting advice... <laughs> <laughs> is that is the distraction? The parenting advice is so confusing. If you ever looked into this whole world of parenting advice, it is so confusing, and there's more and more and more advice each and every day. I'll give you an example. This happens in every domain, but I'll give you one example, feeding. So f there was a time where the vast majority of babies were breastfed, and it was treated as natural and wholesome, and breast milk is the way to go. And then technology came into play, and people said, no, 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 now the, the scientists have figured it out. They've figured out how to create baby formula. It has longer shelf life. We've enhanced it with vitamins and minerals, all that. Now this is better for your kid. So now we feed them formula milk instead. In fact, my mom says that I was a 100% formula-fed baby because my grandma was a proponent of that. Listen to the Westerners. They figured it out. Formula milk is best. And so time went by, and that, that was the prevailing thing. And then after a while, people were like, no, it's corporate agenda. The brands are, are, are widening their margins by giving you the worst ingredients, ultra-processed food. Actually, your baby's gut is not developed to handle lactose. We're all lactose intolerant just to what degree. Don't, don't do it. It affects the microbiome. It affects the immune system. Don't do it. Breast is best. And so it went, it went the other direction. No, no, no. Breast is best. Breast milk is the way to go. And the thing is, to anybody who's ever gone through that breastfeeding journey or like me as a husband, had a front row seat to that breastfeeding journey, it is an absolute nightmare. It can be physically demanding, it's emotionally demanding, it's cyclical, and also, you're doing all of that in a phase of your life where you are sleep-deprived, where you're emotional, it's really difficult. And so you, you start to hear stories of these moms who try and, you know, breast is best, breast is best, and their children are malnourished, they're, they're stick thin, they're skinny to the bone, but no, I will refuse to feed them any formula because breast is best, breast is best, and so after a while, doctors were like, you know what, forget it, just feed them something, anything. Okay, not breast is best, fed is best. Fed is best, okay? Can't secure their future if they're not alive after one year. Just feed them whatever, fed is best. But see, even in the domain of feeding, there was this pendulum back and forth. What do you listen to, right? I'll give you one more example. Something that we consider probably not up for debate actually was, and that is affection for our kids. Listen to this from Nat Geo. Believe it or not, there was a period in the early 20th century where psychologists adamantly warned parents against cuddling their own children. Simple acts of affection, like picking up a crying baby to comfort them or showering them in hugs and kisses, were lambasted as unnecessary and detrimental to a child's cognitive development. If this were true, my children are dead. No chance. This frame of mind would prevail for many decades. Even as a few individuals began to speak out about the observable consequences, it would take a psychologist named Harry Harlow, who conducted controversial and cruel experiments on baby monkeys in the late 1950s, to shake up the psychological community and help inspire a shift to scientifically acknowledge the importance of love and touch to human health. Imagine that. How bizarre that this was actually something that they needed to argue about. But this is what I mean. Parenting advice is so confusing. And literally, this happens in every domain. Education, discipline, I can go on. But the, the point is, a lot of us as parents, I know I felt this way, they react to this, this multitude of information with just, I give up. 
I, I give up, I don't know what to listen to, I resign to the fact that I, we will just always follow the ebb and flow of opinion, what's trendy, what's on social media, I don't know, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, we'll just follow that. And it becomes so much harder to figure out what do we need to do to build strong families. Well, I'm here today to say that I think there is timeless advice that helps us rise above the fray, that helps us cut through the clutter. And to no surprise, we find timeless advice in a timeless book. And so Paul, in the letter to the church of Ephesus today, he's addressing parents and children. He's addressing them about what we need to do to, to build strong families. And so whether you're a parent or whether you're a child, Paul has something for you today. And if you don't fall into either of those categories, uh, <laughs> then go back to the planet from whence you came, right? I mean, so Paul has something for each and every one of us today, regardless of who you are. Now, before we dive into scripture, let's just open up this time in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your voice. And I pray that that voice will speak louder than any voice this morning, including mine. I pray that you give us hearts that will receive and ears that will hear. And we just commit the rest of this message to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Ephesians 6, chapter 1, 6, chapter 1, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. <laughs> There's a... There's someone objecting here. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Well, that's it. Lah. She's just closed in prayer. Is it that simple? Children, obey. Let's, let's dive a bit deeper. So the word obey actually means to stand under authority. It was a military term. It was used to describe soldiers and how they would, they would obey commands, or how they would follow orders. So actually, yes, there is something very strong, very strict, very unquestioning about the word. Paul really is, to some extent, saying, do what your parents tell you to do. But I think the more important part of this verse is the limiter that Paul adds. He says, obey your parents in the Lord. Because that forms the ultimate authority under which the parental obedience finds its context finds its, its meaning. The, the Amplified Version says it quite well. Paul says, Obey your parents in the Lord as His representatives, for this is just and right. I, I think the reason why is this. As children, the primary training ground and the training phase for children to learn what it means to stand under authority is obeying their parents. Because we're going to have authority figures in, in all walks of our life. As a child, as we grow up, we're going to have teachers, we're going to have coaches. If you come to church, you're going to have life group leaders. Uh, Pastor Rodden is, is authority to us. Uh, the government is authority. If you work, you're going to have bosses, you're going to have CEOs. If you're in the army, you're going to have sergeants and officers. All of these authority figures, we need to stand under. And I would guess, this is just me, I, this is not a, a thus saith the Lord, this is just my guess. I would guess that a child that has not learned how to obey parental authority can become an adult that finds it difficult to submit to any kind of authority. I, I, would, I would say that, that that's why the training ground is important because it's a posture of the heart. It's a posture of understanding that these authority figures are placed over us as representatives of the Lord, beginning with our parents. So that's his advice to children, but I think when you talk about children, you encounter another problem. When do these little humans go from being children to not children? Is it 16? Is it 18? Is it 21? Just this week, my eldest daughter, Brooke, she said to me, Dada, why do we have to do what you tell us to do? <laughs> and I said, huh? <laughs> why, why do I have to do what you tell me to do? And I, I'll tell you what I was tempted to say, and I, I, what I think many of you might have responded. You might have gone down the route of, wow, Celine, now, right now, I am your father. <laughs> but you might have gone down the route of, as long as you're in my household, as long as I'm giving you allowance, as long as you're under my roof, until you're married, until you're 21, you might have gone down that route, but I, I decided not to say that. I decided to go a different way. So she said, why do you have to do what I tell us to do? I said, well, you don't have to. And she said, what? <laughs> and I said, you, you don't have to. You, you see, like now, I don't have to do what Grandpa and Nai Nai tell me to do. When you grow older, you won't have to. But from now until then, it is my job to teach you how to think, how to gather information, how to use your brain, Lord knows many adults don't use their brain nearly as much as they should. I didn't say that to her. You, and teach you how to use your brain, teach you how to make good decisions, teach you how to make good choices. And when you can do that, then no, you don't have to listen to me. Now, and she said, 
Okay, and then she went on with whatever she was doing. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that was the best answer or that was the only answer. That's just what I came up with. But I think the alternative is a bit dangerous. The whole idea of, you know, if you're in my household until you get married, until you turn 21, it's so binary. There's a, there's a certain binary on-off threshold to it. It can't be. It can't be that, okay, you obey until you're, you're 21. It means I will obey until the 20th year, 12 month, 31st day. And then once it strikes midnight, mom and dad, you and I are done. You're going to turn me loose and all hell is going to, I, I am not going to obey anymore. It can't be that way. A posture of the heart is a, is a process. It's developed over time. And so I think there's something that extends far beyond childhood than just saying, oh, this is for children. So if I'm not a child, I don't care. And Paul, knowing this as well, goes further to say, oh, it's not just obey. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. But also, honour your father and mother. Honour your father and mother. The word honour is a word that describes a valuation. It's a word that means holding something of great value, of great price, of great reputation. You hold something in very high regard. How do you behave when you treat something of great price and of great value? Maybe you bought a new car, you bought a new laptop, you bought a new phone, you, know, you, you polish it, you handle it with care, you buy a protective cover, you won't just chuck it around, you won't throw it about because it is of great price, it is of great worth. You would treat it of great value. Or maybe it's not, a, not an object, maybe it's a person. Your, your favorite celebrity walks in the room, or, or your, you, you have a crush on somebody, or maybe it's a, a respected politician like, like PM Wong or former PM Lee. This reminded me of a story where um, years ago, my wife Rachel and I, we were in Botanic Gardens, and uh, we, the two of us were walking, and on the same path, walking toward us, was the then PM Lee and his wife Ho Ching. And my wife was like nudging me, saying, hey, he's PM Lee, he's PM. I said, okay, then. And she said, well, what, what do we say? What do we say? I said, what do you mean, what do you say? Just say good morning. <laughs> right? what, what? She said, no, what do, you mean, what do we call him? Do we say sir? Do we bow? You know, do, we, do we say hello PM? You know? and I was like, just say good morning, Mr. Lee. Like, okay, so nervous, nervous. So finally, our, our paths crossed, and I said, good morning, Mr. Lee. Uh, and he said, Dalton, how's the family? No, no, he did not. He did. <laughs> of course, he did not say that. Who am I? He doesn't know who I am. I, I'm citizen 4 million and 35, and I'm just a rando that showed up in botanics that morning. He doesn't know who, he didn't say that. I, I said good morning, and then he just said good morning, and then he walked on by. My, my, my point is that you, you conduct yourself differently when you hold somebody in high regard. The, the reason why there was this, what do we say, what do we say, is because this is not your friend, you know. If you saw PM Lee walking by, you would not go, say hello. You, would, you won't do that, right? I mean, you, I mean, you could. Nothing will happen to you, I think, <laughs> then and there, right? But maybe when you try and renew your passport next year and then you get denied, then uh, yeah, it's on you, you know? So, so, so I, you treat someone that you hold in high regard differently. That's what honour is. It's looking at the authority figures in our life and holding them of great value, of great worth, that they're precious. And I think that's why Paul says, obey your parents, but also in a way that is honouring to them. Ray Stedman, who's a teacher and a pastor, he said this, it is possible to obey with a heart seething with disobedience and hatred, to obey with an icy coldness which is perfectly correct in its action and perfectly wrong in its attitude. It is possible to give obedience with a deceptive compliance that looks like willingness, but inwardly, one is waiting for an opportunity to revolt or break over the lines. So honour is different. And I think honour extends far beyond childhood. Honour applies to all of us. And in, in, in making this point, I think Paul goes further to say, you know what, honour your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. This goes past childhood. Now, it's very important that we do not confuse this verse to mean, obey your father and mother that it may go well with you. He does not say, obey parents equals long life. That's not what Paul is saying. How do I know that's, that's not true? Parents don't have all the answers. Parents will get it wrong many times. I have to recognize that as a parent, I don't have all the answers. I've got a lot of friends of my generation who are very frustrated with their fathers or their parents because they said, oh, our parents sold us a lie. You know, they, all the advice they gave us is, is worthless. They gave us advice about, about property investment, about career, about financials. None of those conditions exist anymore. It's useless to, and so they, a lot of my, these friends were, were frustrated that they were sold a lie. To them, I say, well, if that's what frustrates you, you have to recognize that when your kids come of age, all the conditions in your world will be different too. So don't you dare do the same thing because parents don't have all the answers. We are not going to know what the future holds. We are not going to know what their world is like. 
So no, Paul is not saying, obey your father and mother and you may live long in the land. But honour is a different call to action. Honour is about the way that we view the authority figures in our life. It could be a teacher, it could be a church leader, it could be, it could be a boss at work. Speaking of bosses, I, I told a story in a, in a sermon that I preached a couple of years ago, uh, so some of you might remember this, but there was about a relationship that I had with, with my former boss and, and one that I really, really struggled with. The, the gist of it is that I, I was in this job for about a year um, and the differences in opinion between my boss and myself started to grow more and more. And it was just over time as I learned more about the job, all my ideas about how, you know, what would benefit the business, what would benefit our customers, how we would grow, where the market was going, all that stuff, it, it just kept hitting a ceiling. And she, she was just not really receptive to those ideas. And I think ultimately there was this sense of like, I've been here longer than you, this is how it works. Um, and it was just, I was just not getting through. And it was so frustrating um, that I wanted to quit. And I was like, God, is, this is a waste of my time. I'm a good guy, I'm a smart guy, I want to come into a business and implement things and grow. And I'm spending all my time, instead of doing that, I'm just figuring out how to convince this one person to change her mindset. It's a waste of my time, I'm done. And God said, no, you stay. You are done when I say you are done. And God said, I put you there to love her. Oh my goodness me, that was the hardest job description I've ever received in my life. <laughs> and so I struggled, 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 and it, it got worse. My relationship with her got worse, and it, it came to a point where everything she said and did got on my nerves. And it was like, I would, I, would, I would have to walk out of meetings or leave because I just couldn't, my blood was boiling. It would be, we were in a discussion and I, my face was just jet black. Like, and I, just, I just didn't respond, I just shut down. So I'm not gonna listen, I can't respond, nothing. And I, I, I found myself being more argumentative than I should have. I found myself being, you know, raising my voice a bit more than I should have. Um, and it was my wife, Rachel, who pointed out to me that, hey, you gotta sort this out. It is, it's getting worse. And my wife said, what if God wants to take you and your career and us as a family and financially to the next phase of our destiny, but he's holding back until you, because you refuse to sort this out. And that destroyed me. The idea that uh, uh, my, my family, a generation, will be held back because of my teachability, because of my lack of humility in doing what honour demanded of me. And, and I knew something was wrong because there was a thought that crossed my mind. And immediately when it crossed my mind, I rejected it. And the thought was, you need to apologise to her. Straight away, I said, no. Why should I apologise? I didn't do anything wrong. If anyone, she should be apologizing to me for being so narrow-minded. This and that, this is what went on my head. And, and so I knew that I had to do something because I think when we are not free to extend honor, when we are not free to extend love and kindness to someone, then maybe we're not free at all. And so over that weekend, I prayed, I struggled, 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 and I said, fine. Monday, I, I pulled in a room and I said, listen, I want to tell you that in the last few months, you might have noticed I, I might have come across a bit rude, I might have raised my voice a bit more than I should have, um, and I want to let you know that I'm sorry and I want you to forgive me. And after that conversation, we became best friends. No, no we did not, we did not. <laughs> no, no. Literally nothing changed, okay, literally. And, and that's for me is the thing. Reconciliation isn't about, the facts might not change. Everything might stay the same. Reconciliation doesn't mean bending reality to your will. But it does mean bending your will to what God wants you to do when He wants you to walk in obedience. And so that for me was the biggest thing. So I, I, I did that, I said that, literally nothing changed. Now, that was probably a Monday or a Tuesday. That Thursday, she put me into a room and she said, hey, I got some news for you. Uh, I'm leaving. There's another part of the company that wants me there and I'm gonna get transferred out. Uh, so we're gonna work out transitions and stuff. If I had heard that news any of the months leading up to that moment, my heart would have leapt out of my chest. I would have said, hallelujah, praise be to God. He's delivered me from evil. I would have, I would have gone down that, that route. But, but I tell you that I, I felt nothing. I didn't feel that, that happiness or that whatever that I thought I would. I just felt a sense of calm, a sense of peace. And that was when I knew I was free. And I think if she had left and I had not done what honour demanded of me, what reconciliation demanded, I would have regretted it every single day. And so I think Paul would say that to us. Paul would say, authority deserves your honour. Your father deserves your honour. I'm not condoning what he did to you. I don't know your background but he deserves your honour. Your mother deserves your honour. The leaders in our church deserve your honour. Your boss deserves your honour. We've got one more verse, and then we're going to try and bring this to a landing. Paul turns from addressing children to addressing parents. In verse 4, Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This verse is so meaty. 
that we don't even have time to unpack everything that it says. You can actually go down the route of why does Paul address fathers? Why is he singling them out? Why not parents? Why just fathers? You can go down the route of what does it mean to not provoke your children to anger? Does it mean they can never be angry? You can go down the route of what does discipline mean? What does instruction mean? But I, I'm, I'm going to skip past that because we don't have time today. I think the biggest thing we need to focus on in this verse is actually that last bit. Discipline and instruction of the Lord. Why this is significant is because Paul is not saying, if you're a parent here, bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of your great wisdom. Discipline and instruction of Papa's wise sayings because of his 40 years of industry experience. Not another one of mom's lectures, not more nagging. No, the discipline and instruction that we are asked to raise our children in must be rooted in the Lord. It must be rooted in the Lord. Now, the pushback that I can expect parents will say is they'll say, what do you want of me? We're busy, we've got jobs, we've got to feed the kids and put them to bed. I can't be a Bible scholar. I'm not Pastor Rodden. I didn't go to seminary. I can't memorize scripture. I can't throw Bible verses around. I said, no, actually, I, I think it's much simpler than that. For us to bring our children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord demands that we are undergoing the discipline and instruction of the Lord in our own lives first. And then, it's a simple task, not easy, but a simple task of continually giving our children windows into our own walk with God. See, in the previous verse, we said, obey your parents in the Lord as His representatives. This begs the question, if you're a parent today, how accurate a representative of the Lord are you? When your children see you behave, when your children see you treat others, when they hear you talk, what gets you excited? What gets you down? What gets you emotional? What breaks your heart? Is God ever reflected in that? There are so many people of, of my generation who've walked away from God, from church, from the faith, even though they, they grew up as Christians, even though their parents were Christians. Because to, to them, what they saw was the parents coming two hours on a Sunday, God bless you, raise hands during worship, halala, kumbaya. And then Monday through Saturday, Jesus was never uttered from their lips. Never involved him in their decisions, never involved them in the financial purchases, never involved them in their career. When they were happy, never thank God. When they're, when they're struggling, never seek God. Nothing. And of course, the children are going to walk away saying, you don't actually believe in this. Yeah, it's just a church, is just a charity you donate to. Because they've never seen the discipline and instruction of the Lord carried out in their own lives. In fact, if I polled parents, if I, if I did a survey, I think this is probably true the world over, but especially in Singapore, if I said, listen, parents, what is the win for you? Why do you do what you do? What is success? What will make you say after 20 years of parenting that, you know what, we did a good job? What is that objective that you are driving towards? Why do you parent? I think a lot of people will say things like, we want our kids to be happy, our kids to be healthy, or it might, have, it might be a list that looks like this. Get them into a good school, make sure they mix with the right friends, make sure that they get a solid college education, make sure that financially we leave them a nice big inheritance, Make sure that you know, they have a freehold condo, whatever, the, whatever the, the thing is. Nothing wrong with these things. But I tell you that more, for most parents, helping their children find their own walk with God is nowhere on this list. Even though I think bar none, it should be the top priority. In fact, I think that at the expense of these, okay, it's not mutually exclusive, but if at the expense of these, these things, you help them find their own walk with God, you will still secure your children's future more than if you did that without the first. Of that, I am convinced. And so, I, I, I'll share a story and then we'll close. And, and I only have one set of parents, so I can only share from my perspective. I don't know about other parents. But here's a photo of my, my family. This is my wife, Rachel, myself, our daughters, uh, my sister, my brother, and in the two pink arrows, my mom and my dad. One of the greatest gifts my mom and dad gave us, and many of you know my parents, is that they lived out their faith Monday through Saturday. And we had a front row seat to that all our lives. My mom, she's an intercessor. She, she prays so hard for issues, for people groups, for friends, for family. And it would be very common that, you know, as I was growing up, she would shut her door and it would be her quiet time. And you would know because she would be in there a long time. And often as she's praying and whatever, there'll be a lot of weeping going on. So you, I would walk by on a Wednesday morning and they'll be like, hmm, in the, don't know what's happening. Some warfare is happening in there. I'm glad I'm on her side, okay? I, I would rather her be praying for me than anyone else, but, but there will be some, you know. So one of these days, she comes to me and she says, hey, how are things between you and Rachel, my, my then-girlfriend, now-wife Rachel? 
I can't remember what it was, but you know, maybe we were fighting or we were having a conflict. I don't know what it, really don't know what it was, but I, I was I was kind of down. And she said, uh, "How are things with you and Rachel?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, it's okay, lah. You know, I, I just brushed her off. I didn't want to talk about it." And she was like, "Are you sure? You, you don't look okay." Said, yeah, yeah, you know, I, just, I didn't even want to talk about it. She goes in her room, quiet time. <laughs> she comes out and she says, "Holy Spirit told me something's wrong between you and Rachel. Tell me what it is." <laughs> F- first of all, I was like, "God, thanks." I mean, like, what, what, where, where is the? But. But my mom never had to tell me, Holy Spirit is real, Holy Spirit's power is real, Holy Spirit's voice is real, and if you lean into the Holy Spirit's voice, you're going to achieve outcomes that no one else achieves, you're going to hear truths that no one else hears. Never had to say that. I saw it firsthand. My dad prayed the ironic blessing, that the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, make his face shine. He prayed it over us, I believe the same for my, my, my sister and my brother, every day. He dropped us off at school, every day. There would be times where we, he would drive to school, we're in the driveway, I'm late, I'm going to get booked by a prefect or whatever it was, and I'm about to exit the door, and he holds me back. He says, wait, wait, the Lord bless you. Forget. I'm like, okay, okay, oh my God. Okay, okay, just hurry up, right? My dad never had to say pray unceasingly, pray over the next generation. Prayer is important. He never had to say any of that. I saw him do it. Till today, my wife and I pray the same blessing over our daughters every night we put them to bed. My dad has literally followed really only one piece of career advice his whole career, trust and obey. I've seen him come home and be in tears because he was struggling in the job, he was treated unfairly, there was stuff that was happening that was really out of his control and he wanted out. And I said, like, Daddy, what's wrong? And he would say, I'm in this job, whatever. I said, why don't you quit? He said, can't, God, God said to stay. And every single career move that my dad has, he really followed one advice, trust and obey. God says, move, we move. God says, don't move, we stay. If your presence doesn't go with us, we, won't, we don't want to leave this place. And I shared with you my story earlier, which was just one sliver of how that has applied in my life. Because I saw it in action. And of course, I had to, from an adolescent to an adult, get into my own walk with God. I had my own questions. I found my own answers. I, it turned for me into the God of my parents, to my God. But the point is that they modeled the way every step as I was growing up. There was, there's not a shred of hypocrisy in my mind when they tell me about this God because I saw it in action. And that's what Paul would say. It's about the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And you know what? This isn't even new advice. This is, this is not the first time it's being talked about. Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he gives parental advice as well. He says to fathers, Fathers, when your son asks you in time to come, not if, when. When your son asks you in time to come, Dada, why do I have to do what you tell me to do? <laughs> when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son. Moses does not follow up this statement with, then you shall say to your son, an in-depth analysis of scripture. Then you shall say to your son, well, if you went to church more, you would know. Then you shall say to your son, better do this, ah, better don't do that. Ah, Bible is very clear, ah, this, ah, that. He doesn't say any of that. He says, fathers, when your son asks you this, then you shall say to your son, we were slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us this land, the land that we're living in, that he swore to give our forefathers. And it is then and only then the father says, and this Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear him for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this before the Lord our God. Dad, what's, what's the meaning of all these statutes and laws? The father is supposed to respond, I don't know, but I know one thing. We were slaves, we're not slaves. It's because of God. I will follow him. Why, why would you not? God has done all this for me. Why would you not follow? It's illogical. It's almost irresponsible not to give up everything and follow him. It's the only way. That is the answer. So as we close, I think the, the, what Paul would say to parents is this, talk about your God, not the God of the church, not the, God in, not the theoretical God, not the God of Pastor Rodden, not the God of Dalton. What does God mean to you? How has the discipline and instruction of the Lord shown up in your life? Talk about your God. And so with that, authority deserves your honour. Your father deserves your honour. Your parents deserve your honour. Your bosses deserve your honour. And if you're a parent, 
whether you're a real parent or you're, you're a spiritual parent, to the next generation, talk about your God. They need to hear it from you. They need to hear that He is real. And I think with that, we will be able to build stronger families. We will be able to build stronger societies. And I think if each and every one, did, each and every one of us did this in our own way, this week, that's what life is when it's rooted and fruitful. Can I just invite everyone to stand? I'd love to pray for you. As I was preparing and praying about this weekend, I, I, I got the sense that as the message is going on, for someone today, the Holy Spirit is already dropping things in your heart. And we serve a God of love. And we serve a God of relationships. And so it is, it is no surprise that relationships will be top of priority in, in God's mind especially the relationships that we have with, with family, with authority. And I think for someone today, the Holy Spirit is dropping a name. It's dropping a name of a person. It could be a parent, father, mother. It could be an authority figure. It could be a sibling. And the Holy Spirit is not just dropping a name, but also dropping something that needs to be done or something that is not done. And as a result, honour was not shown. As a result, reconciliation needs to happen. As a result, something was broken and it needs to be restored. And only you know what that is. And only you know what that is this morning. And this morning, I want to give you an invitation to respond to that. You're not responding to me. You're not responding to the people around you. You're responding to God. And relationships are tough. And what you have to do is tough. And what you have to stop doing is tough but I know the promise is that we take one step toward Him, He'll take a thousand toward us. So if that's you this morning, in a second I'm going to count to three and I want us to raise our hand and put it back down and love to pray for you. If something in your life is dishonouring to authority or is harming a relationship or something where reconciliation needs to be set in place, I'd love to pray for you as you step into that. I'm going to count to three and I will ask you to raise your hand and put it back down. One, two, three. Yep, see your hand. Yep, yep see your hands. Yep, 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 yep. Church, let's keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed and let's all pray this together. Father, we give you thanks for the men and women who have responded. Lord, you see our hearts. You see the hearts and the hands that were raised toward you. And Lord, we come first of all to say that we are not enough. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot unwind the years of hurt. We cannot unwind the unfairness. We cannot unwind the injustice. We responded how we responded because I think if anybody in our situation would have done the same. But God, we hear you. And we know that you're asking us to take a step in faith. And Lord, whether it's a conversation, whether it's an apology, whether it's a hug, whether it's a story, whether it's to start doing something or stop doing something, God, I just pray that you give us such wisdom to know how to do it, to know how to set that meeting up, to know how to set that coffee up, to know how to craft the right words, to know, to know how to reach out in the right time and with the right space. And God, I pray that you carry us every step of the way. You hold our hand. And God, I just pray that as these men and women step out in faith and do what you've asked them to do, that you lift the burden. You set them free. That we will be free to love, free to honour, free to be kind, free to speak the right words and free to enjoy the relationships that you want us to enjoy. And I just pray that you give us the courage to go this week and do what we need to do. I just pray a double portion of anointing for each and every one of us this morning. 
and I commit this congregation, your people, to you. And we ask all these things in the matchless, mighty name of Jesus. And everyone says...